This is the story of Gladys Stella Kidd, who went missing in Moorhead, Kentucky, which is in Rowan County. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of a personal side note about this as I get toward the end, but I'm just going to read. I am reading from unsolvedappalachia.org. I don't want anyone to think that I'm plagiarizing someone else's work. I just, I'm reading information off of the internet that's public and sharing um, what I can find about this story. Gladys Stella Kidd was last seen leaving her home August 6, 1990. She resided on a farm that lay along the Triple C Trail in Moorhead, Kentucky. But the 71-year-old widow knew that it was a responsibility she could no longer manage. She had shared concerns with her children, and her son and daughter-in-law had taken her house hunting in Moorhead. But she did not seem interested. Little did they know Gladys had already put her farm up on the market for sale. She finalized the sale of her farm sometime prior to August 6th and afterward cleared out her bank account. The bank associate pleaded with Gladys to take a cashier's check, but she insisted on cash. All in all, she had around $80,000 on her at the time of her disappearance. Gladys took all of her clo clothing, a filing cabinet, and the $80,000 with her whenever she left. Her car was found parked in town with the keys inside. This alludes to her probably having been picked up by someone else. Now, it may sound like she was planning to leave, and all that may be true to a certain degree. However, please keep reading. Gladys had a secret boyfriend. Now, when I say secret, I mean secret. This mysterious caller did not want any of her family, friends, or church people, church family, to know his identity. The calls began a few months before her disappearance. If anyone answered the phone other than Gladys, he would hang up without a word and call back, at which point Gladys would jump up to answer the call herself. It wasn't unusual for her to leave nearly immediately after hanging up. She told her family that they did already know the mystery man and that they would be surprised to find out who he was. The last time she was heard from was through letters postmarked in Lexington. However, were these letters from her or someone else? She had sent letters to, two, to her two daughters and son. In the letters, she had written, Don't try to find me. I would just leave. Don't spend money trying. Love, Mom. The letters struck her children as odd. It was definitely unfamiliar handwriting. But Gladys only had a fourth grade education. Yet the punctuation and grammar in those letters were perfect, and the way they were written was not characteristic of, of her at all. Her children thought it seemed more like she was being coached. Gladys loved her children, and she doted on them and her grandchildren any time that she could. She had only been out of the state a handful of times, and it seemed unlikely to her family and friends that she would have just left without a word. The last thing she would have wanted was to cause them pain. Adding to the unlikeliness of her leaving on her own is the fact that her Social Security checks have gone uncollected since, she, since her disappearance. Her driver's license has never been rene renewed, and her Social Security number has remained inactive. 
In October 2007, law enforcement brought back hose to a location off of Moore's Flat Road in Rowan County. For years, they had wanted to ex excavate this particular spot, but whoever owned the property at the time would not allow it. Now, however, the land belonged to the bank, and they were more than happy to cooperate. As far as I could find, the identity of Gladys's secret boyfriend has never been discovered, and if it has, law enforcement has kept it closed lips. I can only assume that the location they excavated was pro provided either in the form of a tip or some evidence. Okay, here is where I'm going to share some personal information. Now, I did not know this woman or her family. And I did not know the secret boyfriend. I, to this day, do not know his name. But this was told to me, and I'm not going to reveal the source. I shared this on my Facebook page of a few months back, maybe a couple of weeks back. I'm going through here trying to find my message. When I shared this, a person I'm very close to, someone who I've known all my life and who I trust and who I know to be a very honest person, contacted me. And they didn't say that this was private information or that they didn't want to talk about it or didn't want me to reveal who they were but I'm not going to just based on the fact that I, I wouldn't want them to be contacted or anything like that so this person says to me that they know the secret boyfriend and that it was someone that they were related to through marriage and that this man and his family were questioned about this due to the fact that this woman had kept him a secret, but hadn't kept him a secret entirely. That there were rumors of who he was, and that at the time that he had been que that he was questioned by the police and his family as well. And probably the reason why his name was never put out, as far as I know, it was never put out, was because law enforcement was hoping to find some more information out about this. So, according to this person, after this woman disappeared, suddenly this man, who was rumored to be the secret boyfriend and who law enforcement did question, came up with a substantial amount of money and bought a house and a piece of property. Um, around 2006, I think. Let me go back and look. 2007. Around 2007, this person lost the property. The bank foreclosed on it. Now keep in mind, in the article that I just read from, from Unsolved Appalachia, it was reported that the police had wanted to dig up this property because rumors were flying around about the owner of this property and this woman's involvement. But he refused. And without any kind of, I guess, evidence, they really couldn't get a warrant for it. I, I'm assuming. This is just me assuming. But when the bank, when the bank foreclosed on the property after the man was no longer paying for it, they allowed the law enforcement to go onto the property and they dug up the property and they dug up a septic tank. Um, they didn't find anything. But now this was told to me by this person in 
but who was who was related by marriage that this man was an avid fisherman and that he was very familiar with the waterways around uh, Cave Run, which is located just there right near Moorhead, near the town. There's a lot of waterways in, in this area and that he was an avid fisherman who owned a boat and was often in these backwaters fishing and that the rumors were that he had taken this lady fishing a few times and um, he knew the water very well. He knew all of these different bodies of water very well and um, that it's rumored within the family and within just people talking that this lady was probably dumped somewhere in one of these waterways in some back end of this of the water, maybe Cave Run or some other location, some other waterway in the area, or it could have even been farther away. But because as it was said, she told no one she was leaving. She told no one that um, who this boyfriend was, despite the rumors. That was all they had to go on. And this person said that their involvement with this family, that their experience that they came away with from knowing this man was that he was a very um, spiteful type of person, that he just came across as somewhat evil in their opinion. And... Um, Uh, I think both this man and the family member who who this person was related to through marriage, I think they're both deceased now. This, this man who was accused of being the secret boyfriend is deceased. And um, that was all that they told me. But they told me that there was more to it and that they would tell me when they saw me in person. They didn't want to put it in writing. This is the reason why I would never reveal who they are or anything like that. But it's my belief, after having been told this, that this man coaxed this woman into selling her farm, cashing out all this money from the bank, and he was promising her this life together of they were going to travel or whatever. The, the fact that the letters were postmarked Lexington. Lexington's probably an hour from Moorhead. So this person, it, is it possible that he that she was still alive at that time because the family said the letters did look like they may have been in her handwriting because she had a very low education level so her handwriting was not articulate, not, you know, um, that they kind of recognized it as her handwriting. But could it be have been that he had her write these letters out to her family prior and just say, tell your family not to try to find you because you're going to be off enjoying your life, you know? Or did he have her write these letters under duress? Did he threaten her? Did he threaten her family in some way? You know, this is just my speculation, but as soon as I get an opportunity to meet up with this person that told me this, I will sit down with them and see what else they have to offer and uh, this is really all I have to go on now there's never been any other information about this that I know of and um, I don't know if this this was in 2000 let's see what year did she go missing 1990 yeah 1990 so basically 32 years ago, um, she would be 
well over 100 years old now, so of course I doubt very much that she would still be living if she had not been murdered or met with some fate like that. Um, my opinion is she was probably murdered prior to those letters having been mailed or immediately after that, maybe within a day or so after that. He may have taken her out of town. He may have said, let's go, we're going on this trip, you know. And Lexington, having an airport, she may have thought, we're going to the airport, we're going to go on this trip, we're going to go, you know, spend this money and enjoy our, our life together. And there's a lot of waterways, you know, between here and there. He may have had his boat hooked up. I don't know, I'm just speculating here. You know, just having, I, I never would have had any idea about who he might have been or anything like that until this person reached out to me. And um, so when I decided to make this video, I'm making this video just from what I'm reading here and what I was told myself. Uh, see if there's anything else on the internet about this. Um, this is from the KentuckyStatePolice.org website. The cold case disappearance of Gladys Stella Kidd. And it's basically the same thing, just tell them that she went missing in 1990 with a large sum of money. She received from selling her farm privately, unbeknownst to her children. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, it just gives the name of the, the trooper who's working the case, Toby Gardner. Now this was published, um, let's see, I'm not seeing a published date on this. I don't see a published date on this. Here is from the Charlie Project, and I believe this might have been the post that I shared when this person reached out to me. Um, Stella was five foot five, weighed 140 pounds. She was a Caucasian female with brown curly hair. She had one brown eye and one green eye. She wore eyeglasses. And in some cases, she went by Stella. Some people knew her as Stella, and others knew her as Gladys. Um, she had cashed a $56,000 check. The bank wanted to give her, I've already read that, the bank wanted to give her a cashier's check. Now here's a strange thing that's mentioned in each one of these articles. When she left, all she took with her was the money and a filing cabinet. Is it possible that this man put her inside this file? I mean, was it a big, huge filing cabinet? Five foot five, 140 pounds? Did he cut her body up and put her inside this filing cabinet and then seal it up and dump it into the water? Why would she take nothing more with her but this filing cabinet? What what did this filing cabinet contain? Um, she left behind all of her other belongings. And that's really all that's... You know, I, I'm looking on here to see if there's any more... Anything that maybe had come from my child... From the family, from the children. Um, here is one from the Doe Network. Case file 2493 DFKY. Gladys Stella Kidd. Uh, it gives the same statistics. Her height and weight. She wore glasses. She had a partial 
uh, teeth. Her DNA is available. They did have DNA samples. And I guess that if uh, her children had probably given blood samples or whatever, that's pretty much it. It's the same thing. The only word from her was a letter received about 17 days after she disappeared, postmarked from Lexington, Kentucky. And that's all. That's all that's ever put on here. The strangest part of this whole story is the filing cabinet. The filing cabinet is like this big red flag. I mean, this whole thing is a big red flag, of course, but why the filing cabinet? Did anyone in her family have a clue as to why this filing cabinet, did it have sentimental value to her? See, this is where I come up with this theory, <coughs> my personal theory, that the filing cabinet is probably where her body is located. So in the event that anyone should ever be out fishing or, you know, deep deep water sonar, these boats, you know, fish finders and that type of thing, and should happen to see a filing cabinet laying on the bottom of a waterway somewhere in Kentucky, in the cave run area, or like I said, it could be anywhere between there and Lexington. I mean, 17 days after her disappearance would have been toward the end of August. So, you know, there's a lot of people out on the water fishing in August. I don't know what kind of boat this man had. I don't know if it was a pontoon or if it was a small fishing boat, like a bass boat maybe, a tracker. I don't know. But the filing cabinet says to me, she's probably been cut up, or maybe he took one drawer out, stuffed her into the filing cabinet, sealed it up with duct tape or something of that nature, and dumped her someplace. Maybe not even in the water, maybe in some landfill, you know? I mean, who would think, if you drove, you know, if, there, if, if the people working at a landfill saw a big filing cabinet out there, uh, they would probably just cover it over and think it was more trash. But if I get an opportunity to sit down with this person and have a conversation and they offer up more information about this, I will share, and, unless it's something that is revealing, personal revealing. Because I would not ever want to do anything that would, you know point a finger at anybody. The only thing that, um, like I said, the, this man that's accused or thought to have been the boyfriend uh, is, is deceased now. I don't know his last name, so I, I know his first name, but I don't know his last name, so I would have trouble looking that up. But thank you all for listening, and uh, if I find out any more information about this, I will uh, I will make a follow up. Thanks for listening.